Hi everyone, I'm Jenna Payone from A Mighty Blaze. Welcome to our Thursday Celebrity Author Conversations. Um, today, I am thrilled. I have these two dashing gentlemen with me here today. We have David Nichols and Elliot Ackerman joining us from both sides of the pond to celebrate the release of Elliot's newest book, Red Dress in Black and White. And oh my God, the timing on that, Elliot, was perfection. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, welcome guys. How are you today? Great. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to introduce them really briefly and then let them take it away and have a, a wonderful talk. Um, I encourage all of you who are watching at home to get your questions ready. Um, we are moderating the conversation and we'd love to uh, share some of your, your you know, burning questions with um, both authors and have them answer later on. But uh, here we go. Without further ado, first up, I'm going to introduce David Nichols, our celebrity interviewer today. The Guardian has called David Nichols the man who made a nation cry because of his bittersweet love story, One Day, an international bestseller which also became a movie. Nichols's novels have sold over 8 million copies worldwide and are published in 40 languages. He trained as an actor. Fun fact, his stage name was David Holdaway. Is that true? That's true, yeah. My mother's maiden name. <laughs> That's awesome. I am also a former actor myself. Right. <laughs> Although I just kept Jenna Payon for that. <laughs> uh, so that's what he did before making the switch to writing. And he recently won a BAFTA for Patrick Melrose, his adaptation of the novels by Edward St. Aubin, who also, which also won him an Emmy nomination. Congratulations on that. Thank you. His new novel, Sweet Sorrow, will be coming August 4th, and we at The Blaze can't wait to promote that and David as well. Here are just some of the advanced raves from Booklist, this starred review. With fully fleshed out characters, terrific dialogue, bountiful humor, and genuinely affecting scenes, this is really the full package of a rewarding romantic read. I know, isn't it so awkward to have to listen to yourself be It is. Yeah. <laughs> I just a little bit more, I promise. And then, uh, then Elliot, uh, you know, up at the firing squad. This is from Library Journal. With his usual grace, Nichols plums human relationships, this time offering a singular reading experience about one man, young man's fraught coming of age. Nichols masterfully unfolds events, the depth of feeling between friends, family members, and lovers, first time or not. Nichols captured it, captures it all. Highly recommend. And from Publishers Weekly, Nichols excels at capturing Charlie's insecurity, the messy exuberance of first love, and the coarseness of teenage male friendships. A good deal of fun. Welcome, David, and thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. And now on to Elliot, the man of the hour, the star, his new book, Red Dress in Black and White. We are so thrilled about it. Congratulations. Critically acclaimed Elliot Ackerman is the author of the novels Waiting for Eden, Dark at the Crossing, and Green on Blue, as well as the memoir Places and Names on War, Revolution, and Returning. His books have been nominated for the National Book Award, the Andrew Carnegie Medal in both fiction and nonfiction, and the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. His writing often appears in Esquire, The New Yorker, and Time Magazine, and his stories have been included in the Best American Short Stories and the Best American Travel Writing. He is both a former White House Fellow and Marine, and served five tours of duty in Iraq and Afghanistan, where he received the Silver Star, the Bronze Star for Valor, and the Purple Heart. And I have to say, this officially makes you the most rewarded author we've had on in history in a variety <laughs> of ways. So thank you very much for your service. We really appreciate it. Thanks. His new novel, Red Dress in Black and White, unfolds over a single day in Istanbul as an American woman tries to leave her life in Turkey and her Turkish husband. Library Journal in a starred review raves that it is an attention-grabbing, cleverly plotted, character-driven yarn. Booklist says that Ackerman's trademark prose evocatively captures the strained nature of contemporary Turkish life. He deftly hits, hints at a shadowy world that exists just out of frame and is one that lives long in the memory. Welcome, Elliot. Congratulations, and thank you so much for being here. Great. Thanks for having me. And now, without further ado, I'm going to let David take over. I'm going to let you two chat. I'm going to monitor the conversation, and I'm going to sit back and listen and enjoy, just like our viewers. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. And it's it's really um, such a pleasure to talk about this book. I mean, I really loved it, and I was full of admiration for things which 
I, as a writer, am really intimidated by things that I, I, I'd be very wary of, and they're done with such skill. And I thought of a lot of writers as I was reading uh, La Carre and Graham Greene and the way you kind of interweave emotional relationships with politics and a very specific sense of time and place. And I suppose that's what I wanted to talk about first, really, because uh, it's, it's very difficult to write authentically about another culture, another city. And in this book, it feels really lived. It feels very precise and very accurate without ever being overly research laden. It just feels very natural. And I've only briefly been to Istanbul, but I wondered, I know you spent time there. Were you, did you write in the city or did you write from your memories of the city? And what kind of research tools do you use when you're, when you're trying to recreate a very specific sense of time and place? Sure. Well, well, thanks for that. Um, you know, I don't know that I, I've never felt like I'm someone who does research in the sense of when someone says research to me, I have images of, you know, an individual getting lost in the stacks at a library. Yeah. Uh, so most of my research is, is, is lived. And I, I lived in Istanbul for almost three years. Uh, I also work as a journalist. And at the time, I was covering the Syrian civil war. Uh, in the south. So I was based out of Istanbul and doing a lot of work on that conflict. And when I lived there, you know, particularly amongst my Turkish friends, this was in the years immediately after the Gezi Park protests. And the book really sort of centers around the 2013 Gezi Park protests. For people who aren't familiar with that, I would say it was really sort of the, the closest thing Turkey had to an Arab Spring moment. And it was probably the most significant threat to the current Turkish regime that had existed in you know, at least a generation um, to, to the edifices of power in Turkey. So I moved there kind of just in the months right after Gezi. And I could see amongst all my Turkish friends and in the city how there were still sort of these aftershocks and these tremors and how those events were like rippling out into the lives of everybody who lived there to include people in the expatriate community of which I was a part. Um, so I sort of, so the, the idea of this novel started germinating, you know, and the novel, it the present action in the novel takes place in a single day when an American woman, a woman named Catherine, uh, who is living in the city with her Turkish husband, decides that she is going to leave the city and go back to the United States with an American photographer she's met who has become her lover. And so she attempts to do that. Hmm. And in that sort of like boat rocking gesture, we start to see the many ways that Catherine's life is connected and how it's connected to not only her husband's life, to all the other people who are connected to him and how there is sort of this societal architecture that's holding her in place. Mm -hmm. And so the book kind of toggles between this one, that one day and then many of these events that had taken place, not only at Gezi Park in 2013, but over prior years to that as well. And so it's toggling between this present moment, but also, the past and the architecture, not only of their marriage, their life, but also the architecture of the city in which they live. And I think that's what interests me most in my writing is writing about events that are both like deeply personal and intimate, like a marriage, but that also seem to connect seamlessly with much broader uh, political and then social events and showing the connections between the two. Yeah, I, I thought that was um, fascinating uh, to read a book that really does place human relationships in a very particular time and place and even though it, it I mean it has elements of espionage and deceit all of those themes are there uh, loyalty deceit um, but it's very much a kind of soft power it's it's about the world of culture uh, there's a, a wonderful character Kristen who's a cultural attache and about the world of business as well so it's it, it is about foreign power and responsibility and involvement in foreign regimes but in a in a in a very original way I, I i wondered is that something that you again researched or is it something you were aware of in your time in the city i think i think both i count my time in the city sort of as research because it's lived research and so my life is research you know Kristen, the character you know you refer to is you know she is she's introduced as a cultural attache I don't think it's revealing too much as the book goes on we learn that her duties at the consulate in Istanbul you know extend into areas that exceed uh just the, the culture of the city 
and into you know work that has to do with intelligence and other and other matters. Um, you know, and I had a whole nother life in the military, so I sort of saw how you know how tangentially how intelligence was run out of embassies. Um, you know, and there's also an aspect that has to do with the business world. And living in Turkey, I could see how particular uh, Turkish real estate you know real estate developers inside Turkey have a very unique and prominent role. Uh, within the society, particularly within Istanbul in the last 20 years, because the city has undergone this complete transformation and just boom of construction, which really the Gezi Park events uh, undermined and threatened to undermine this period of rapid modernization and expansion. So, I mean, I imagine you could probably relate to this. You know, you're just sucking everything in and you don't know how it's all going to come up. And then one of the joys of writing a book is you know it, it surfaces in in unexpected uh, and often very gratifying ways uh, in the story. I mean, I found that really admirable and fascinating. It's very rare to find business as a subject dealt with so seriously and so authentically and in such detail. Um, you know, often writers come from a kind of arty literary world, and they, 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 they business is sort of not really engaged with as a subject, but but it, it is here, but never in a dry way. It's always related to, to character. And I was really fascinated by the kind of parallels you make between business and art, how both worlds are rife with um, influence and a kind of genteel bribery and uh, political um, engagement. Uh, I thought the way you cut between the intrigue of the art world and the intrigue of the business world was was really fascinating. I think one of the themes in the book is sort of this, also this theme of like, of authenticity. You know, all of the characters, whether it's, you know, Catherine, the woman who's fleeing, you know, who has never really figured out who she is. I mean, she's moved to a foreign country and is, you know, is married to, a, you know, she's in a difficult relationship. She's searching for her authentic self. Peter, her lover, her lover, who's a photographer, he's trying to make the leap from photojournalism to becoming a fine arts photographer. And Catherine's husband, Marat, who is this real estate developer, um, you learn very early on in the you learn very early on in the book that he he comes he's the scion of a wealthy family um, that made its money through through real estate uh, and construction, but his great act of rebellion is he chooses to study architecture as opposed to business, and so he becomes a businessman, but in his kind of his authentic self is this architect. So all of them are sort of vying for their authentic selves. And I think that's something that you see, you know, not only with artists, but also with businessmen, you know, people trying to find their, their sense of purpose and how they fit in the world. Yeah. Writing about art, I'm always interested as to whether, I mean, I found myself Googling as I was reading the book, uh, whether the art was real, whether you were imagining particularly, whether you had particular photographs in mind, or whether you were kind of inventing an artist's approach, because that's a, a, a terribly difficult thing to do, to be, as a novelist, to kind of invent an artist's body of work mm -hmm. if you're not experienced as an artist. Right. Do that authentically and not feel as if you're parodying or faking yeah. it. How much of the art and photography in the novel is real and how much is it maybe it's a kind of almost a sort of a fictional portfolio that you, the novelist, have created? Sure. I First of all, I readily acknowledge that it is, it's difficult to try to create art, uh, fictional art in a book. I would say, you know, when we go back to the subject of research, one of the areas I feel very fortunate is that working as a journalist, I have many very dear friends who are photojournalists. Yeah. And when we get put on assignment together, we spend, you know, days and days and hours and hours sitting around going from point A to point B to point C. So I felt very much, you know, like I understood that world and through those friends of mine understood the different ways they looked at their work um, mm -hmm. and the different conflicts that they felt with their work as, as, as photojournalists. Um, there are real artists mentioned in the book and there are, you know, and there are works of arts that are, that are pieces of invention. Like one of the real artists who's mentioned is a sort of very brutal hyper-realist. Uh, yeah, yeah. In uh, I don't know if you Googled any of his yeah, stuff. Dude, yeah, it's pretty <laughs> <laughs> And, um, uh, and then the, you know, the title of the book, um, Red Dress in Black and White is a reference to a very specific photograph, uh, that was really the iconic image of Gezi Park. Um, you know, and Gezi Park wa was 
uh, a series of protests that basically spread across Istanbul in the spring of 2013. It began when some environmental activists were protesting the development of a really small, if you look at Gezi Park, it's just a small plot of grass in the middle of Istanbul, but they were protesting that yet another building was gonna go up in one of these few green spaces in the city. And it turned into nationwide protests that really brought in a lot of people who never thought they might've been protesting in the first place. And so red dress in black and white refers to this iconic photograph of the woman in the red dress. And the woman in the red dress is just a young Turkish woman who is on her way to work. And she's wearing a red dress, carrying a white bag over her shoulder, which is obviously you know, the national colors of Turkey. And a policeman has got the nozzle of his pepper spray can right in her face and he's, he's spraying her and her, her hair mm -hmm. is swept up. And so that is a real photograph. Sort of what the book imagines in parallel is that Peter, one of our protagonists, the photojournalist who's trying to make this transition, he takes he takes a photograph of the exact same woman, except he shoots it in black and white. Yeah. And it never resonates quite the same way. I wondered, I mean, that, that photograph is taken in this uh, extraordinary set piece in the center of the book. And it, it was so well accomplished that I, I couldn't help asking. I mean, I, I can't help asking, were you there? I mean, did, were you present for the riots? Or is that just assembled from reportage and photographs? No, I wasn't. I wasn't there for the actual riots. I probably moved there about four months later. But I spent it, you know, and in very much, in some ways, remind me a little bit of my of my wartime experience. In that, all of the friends that I had who had been there, you know, they were all very much in the years after processing it. So it was just the the continual subject of dinner conversation, drinks conversation. Um, were all of those events. So you very much, you very much lived with the stories surrounding Gezi Park. Um, and there were also subsequent protests that uh, I found myself involved in. So you got a feel for sort of, you know, how the Turkish police deployed and what it would look like if there were a protest on Istakal Chidesi, which is the main avenue that runs through Istanbul, where a lot of these protests took place. So I was fortunate that I, I did, you know, see uh, firsthand some of, some of those later protests. I was also really fascinated by the connection you make between gender politics and the politics of that time and, and, and the way that uh, transgender protesters are, are, are sort of picked out by Peter the artist and uh, as emblematic of, of the protests. I found that the investigation of, of gender politics, politics in Turkey really fascinating and, uh, and um, uh, again, is, were you um, in contact with people in that world? Is it something that was controversial in Turkey, which from, to an outsider can often seem like a very conservative society? Well, I think Turkey as a country is a very conservative society, but then Istanbul is not Turkey. It's like, you know, it's like London is not the UK and New York City is not America. So Istanbul is a place where you have all these incredible cross currents um, not only of Turkish society, but European society and, uh, and Islamic society, you know, all pulling against one another. Um, so I think it was, you know, it was widely known that, you know, in the history of Gezi Park and, and often said, as is mentioned at the book, that, you know, against the police barricades at Gezi Park, the toughest men were the transsexual women because this was a minor minority group that when Gezi Park happened and you had you know, women like the red dress and sort of all these other Turks who got involved but weren't politically active before, the groups that had been the most politically active for years and had been most antagonized by authority for years, and it's not surprising, were groups like transsexuals and uh, you know, the gay and lesbian community in Istanbul. Um, and so when it kind of came time to form the vanguard of this movement, particularly in the early days, the people who really understood intuitively how to organize and how to do this was that, was that community. And so that comes up um, in the novel. Um, and then, you know, in writing about it, it was, you know, as I lived there, you know, I, I think a lot of people don't realize this, but the largest sort of um, gay pride parade in, in the Muslim world uh, is in Istanbul every year. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've been and marched in that parade. Um, and it's, you know, it you walk through it just wide-eyed with the with the contradictions as you're seeing, you know, transgendered people, transsexual people, gay, lesbian people marching with a rainbow flag, you know, in the shadow of these mosques, you know, surrounded by people who might have, you know, you know, women in head to toe, no, head to toe niqab covered, who might have flown in from, you know, the Emirates. So it's really striking 
to just see like such a uh, social and political melange. But again, you know, the book is also sort of like it's a Valentine to that city because yeah. that, that is always what Istanbul has been before yeah. it was Turkish. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's very powerful. The, the love of the city and the, the culture it really comes across. And I love also that, you know, when you're writing about um, political strife, often there's a tendency to, to pick a side. And yet in your characterization, you're extremely even handed. And, and Murat, who in many ways is a, a more conservative uh, figure, you know, has his own pathos, his own disappointment. There's a wonderful wonderful scene with the hammer and the nail where he's trying to come across as a strong, decisive man. And, and yet his fallibility is very apparent. And I, I love that about all the characters, that there was no uh, judgment, They're very even handed, um, that, that everyone had a reason for their behavior. Um, I thought that was one of the great achievements of the book. I'm aware that this isn't a question, it's just a kind of just me <laughs> uh, expressing my admiration. Thank you. I'm sure you feel the same way in your work. Like, you know, you, you, there's always the, I feel there's always the impetus to, you know, that when you're writing your characters to not only like suspend judgment, but to really give them their moment to make their case to the reader as though they're making their case before God. Um, yeah. and I find that takes sort of a certain level of intellectual discipline because, you know, because it's easy to sort of slide off and start putting down on the page what you might think about a character, but the re yeah. The reader's not interested in what you think, you know, they yeah. get in someone who's alive and they'll, you know, they'll figure that out. Yeah. You're uh, in demand. <laughs> <laughs> You're in demand today. <laughs> no, you can't, I can't talk now. We're in the middle yeah. of an interview. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, maybe you should take it. <laughs> um, yeah, that would be funny. Hey, you're live on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I, I did really admire that. And it's true. I mean, sometimes uh, the very last book event I did, someone said, who's the villain of this book? And instinctively, I kind of bridled against the question because uh, it's a mistake to think in those terms. I think you always have to say, what is this character's reason? What, why, are they, uh, why are they behaving in this way? And, and explore that if, if you want to create something, hopefully, that's rich and complex for the reader. Well, I think you have to, re you have to leave space. Like the yeah. books that I enjoy reading are the ones that I always feel like are giving me space to form my own thoughts and, mm -hmm. and opinions as to what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, well, if you feel I achieved that, thank you. No, I did very much so, very much so. I thought also, and I, I try, I must, uh, when I uh, have these conversations, mustn't get too kind of tied up with craft, but I, I, I'm really fascinated by structure. And you have this wonderful structure of two interweaving strands, uh, a kind of 24 hours intercut with, uh, is it four, five, four, it must be seven years, mustn't it? But from the uh, sort of key moments from seven years interwoven with the action of 24 hours. How much of that is, is instinctive and how much of that is kind of blocked out in the sort of, almost a sort of screenwriterly way of, of, of plotting each chapter before you actually write the content? Yeah, you know, I mean, listen, I think I mean, everybody works differently. So I don't say this with any authority of like, this is what works. But I, you know, I've never been someone to outline. Um, and I find that I have to have a real tolerance to have faith that the, the path forward is going to reveal itself to me, which at times can be frightening because you don't know how this is going to go and you keep investing yeah. time into a story. But I think with this with this book, I, I realized somewhat early on that it was going to have to be, that there were, it would be toggling between yeah. sort of the present and, you know, in the deep, in the deep past. And that, you know, that felt appropriate. Um, you know, and then as you know, you get to the end and you start refining exactly where things are happening. I mean, it's probably yeah. no surprise for you to know that as I'm writing the book, I don't know exactly where this point is on the timeline. I just know it's, it's in the past. It's not yeah. Far past, this is sort of medium past. And then I start figuring out exactly when this happened. Um, but it certainly, you know, writing, you know, writing a book with a structure like that as opposed to a more linear structure, you know, it I think you have to suspend judgment a little bit longer about knowing exactly where everything is, but then you also have to be able to go back and really be able to tinker with it so everything, everything lines up uh, appropriately in the structure. 
And does that apply to plot as well? Because I was really, uh, you know, it's full of amazing twists and turns that are in no way signposted. I, 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 I was constantly surprised by the narrative. And do you, you, are you, are you kind of, is there an element of improvisation in that? I think it's sort of like, you know, when I am working on a book, I feel like if I were to, if I were to make an analogy, I would say every day I go and I sit at my desk and it's as though I have this huge sack of puzzle pieces in like a very, in a dark bag and I can't see them. And I'm reaching into the bag and I pull out a piece, particularly early on, I say, this is the puzzle piece. It has a round curve, it's straight on top and I'm describing the piece and I put it on the table. And I kind of keep taking out pieces and I'm accumulating this stack of pieces on my desk. And then inevitably I'm still taking out my piece but I start seeing like, oh, that one fits in there and that fits in there and this makes sense. And that means this next one's gonna look. And then it all starts laying itself out. And, I, and slowly I begin to see who the characters are and the plot. Um, you know, I'll have a sense of what the book is about and where it's going generally. Mm. Uh, but that's when you know the clarity comes. And to me, that's like the great joy of creating a book is the satisfaction of like those moments when you realize how it all fits together. It's very, it's exciting. And this is, it's your, your fifth book, am I right in, in saying fourth that? Fourth novel. Fourth novel. Fourth, fourth, fourth book. I have a memoir too. Because I, I found, um, you know, the sense of, of location was so powerful. I wonder, do you have, I mean, when I think, I mentioned Graham Greene earlier, and when I think of Graham Greene, I think of, you know, the African novel, the Haiti novel, the Brighton novel. Do you, does, is place often a starting point for you or, or do you start with something more thematic or character driven? Sometimes it's both. I think it will be, um, it'll be thematic. I mean, it, and I think each book is different, so it's tough to say, but I think, I think most of my books do seem to have a heavy sense of place uh, in, in, that, that they're imbued with. My first novel was set in Afghanistan. My second was set in Southern Turkey and along the Turkish Syrian border. My third was set in mostly in the San Antonio burn ward um, in the United States. So um, uh, yeah, I think, I think it's nice when you can. And I always try to keep in the back of, the, of my mind that I want to handle place like it's a character in the book because I want the reader to, I want to convey to the reader the best I can, the feelings that I have for that place, mm -hmm. what that, what that, place makes me feel and I feel like that I uh, the closest analogy I know how to do that is to treat it as though it is a character um, yeah. in the book and create the and create the space that way no I think that that really comes across I I do you have it do, I mean could you point to every scene on a map could you does it does it go that far could you you could say that this cafe is here and yeah oh yeah, yeah. I've, yeah. I've been to most of those places yeah. or you know or there are places that are amalgamations of places. I mean, I imagine right. it's gonna be the same in your work. It might not be that you can, you know, there's some places that you can point to or there are even scenes where you can say, there's a mo key moment in this scene and this is sort of the, um, the lineage of that scene. You know, yeah. it comes from this thing that happened to me over here yeah. and then I changed these bits and, you know, and it wound up in the book. And that's, um, you know, and I sort of love that. Like the forensic analysis you can do um, yeah. on a book you know and when I wrote a memoir the memoir I wrote I think that was actually sort of the one of the, the things that was fun about it was it was sort of this key to some of the novels that you could see a lot you know certain scenes in the novels were also represented you know in the, yeah. in the memoir yes no very much so I I I am um, I and it also as you say it changes from book to book I, I wrote a book which was about this kind of grand European tour mm -hmm. and with that I was I spent most of my day on Google Maps, trying to work out, you know, that if you stood on the street corner, could you see the Eiffel Tower and kind of clicking my way, following the character's path. Other books, it's more abstract. It's more of a feeling, a, 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 a kind of um, embellished memory or, or, or a, a, a sort of a sensory memory rather than a geographical one. Um, I don't know if you do this, like if I'm, I mean, listen, there's certainly places that I've written about where, you know, I just can't get there. Or I know this has to be here. And like, you know, maybe I drove through once 20 years ago. So I know that I'm going to have to, you know, yes, go on, I'll go on Google Maps. I'll make sure everything lines up. But then in my mind, I'll be like, okay, but how am I trying to make this feel? Yeah. yeah. I might go to another place. I'm like, okay, this feels like the house that I used to go to as a kid. 
or a place I actually really find myself doing that a lot of the time is with um, characters early on in the draft. I will, I will frequently name characters in a book after people that I know. Wow. Not, not <laughs> because they are that person. I know like they're not yeah. going to be this person, but I'll be like, this person is like generally kind of like a, you know, like a Susie yeah. type, you know, yeah. Jim type. And I'll be like, all right, Jim. And then they'll start doing things that are like way outside. And then the name, the names inevitably always change by the time I get to the end. But I, as I know, this is maybe something specific to me. I always feel like in early drafts, I need to do that. So I can sort of, it's like, so I'm like holding the character close. So I don't slip out of my grip. And then once they become fuller, I don't need to hold quite as tightly. Yeah, for me, it's actors. You know, I kind of think, well, this, you know, not, not actors who you would cast in the movie, but actors who have a kind of persona or tone of voice or an attitude to the world. So I might think, you know, this is the, he's kind of a Jack Lemmon character, or this is the Catherine Hepburn role. Uh, and um, and again, it's important that it's secret knowledge. You know, it's, it's right. something you wanna carry with you when you're writing. It's a tool for writing, but not something you'd ever want to reveal. It's uh, yeah, it's like saying, you know, you're doing a sculpture. It's like, you know, I've got a lump of blue clay. Okay, it's blue clay for now. It's gonna be something yeah. different, but you have to yeah. start somewhere. Um, so I find myself, I find myself doing that with characters, you know, and, and to a degree doing it with place too. Yeah. Yeah. This is a terrible question because, uh, especially at the moment, it's always a terrible question, but at the moment it's a particularly kind of loaded question, but are you thinking of the next one or do you, are you, you kind of letting things stew at the moment? Are you, are you even contemplating writing or have you already embarked on something new? No, I do. I have a, um, I have uh, a, my next novel that's just mine is actually set in London uh, over, oh, right. uh, over a period of time during the 2016 London Bridge attacks. Um, and, it's oh, about, wow. and it's about a financier. Um, so I'm back doing a little bit in business. Um, and then I have a project I'm also doing, which is um, a work of speculative fiction that will be out in the US in the spring that I co-wrote with a uh, a fellow named uh, Jim Stavridis. He's a retired four-star admiral who's a friend of mine. And um, it's a work of speculative fiction about what it would look like if the US and China went to war in the year 2034. Wow. So the novel's called 2034. Um, and it's fun. It's a little bit of a departure for me, um, sort of more of like a kind of, you know, uh, page turner yeah. thriller. But it's been a lot, it was a lot of fun to sort of enter that alternate realm of of what that might look like and to sort of build out characters who live through this year. Um, so that's sort of been, those two projects have been the one keeping me, keeping me the, most, uh, the most busy these days. That sounds fascinating. Are you, are you sending the manuscript back? Are you, are you co-writing or is it more of a- No, we, we finished it. So it's sort of in okay, copy, right. copy edits right now. Um, but it was, you know, I had, never, I had never worked that way before. And he and I have the same editor at Penguin Press uh, and he had pitched the idea and our shared editor said, well, you know, you and Elliot are friends and you should work with a novelist on this. We'd known each other for years. And it was a lot of fun. We would sit down and, you know, outline the chapters and then uh, kind of get to work on them and, you know, tweak them a little bit. Um, and so, yeah, it was, it was actually, it was a really enjoyable experience. I, I, I mean, I screenwrite as well. And obviously there's a lot of that kind of process yeah. with screenwriting and with fiction. I always, because it's, I don't know, I, I feel more, I find it quite hard, I think, but but I think perhaps if you if you both have a shared vision and you and you uh, and you can plan it out and and a shared voice, I, th I can imagine that being really exciting. It sounds like a, a fantastic idea as well. Well, it's fun. I think I would imagine you. Know, I haven't done any screenwriting, but I would imagine it's sort of like a hybrid of that. I think with you know with fiction, as you know, it has to it has to live initially with someone. I has someone has to do the first draft. So I was sort of doing the first drafts. We do detailed outlines and I would say, okay, now, you know, I have to sit there and see, someone has to see the scene first, you know, how yeah. the person's going to touch his face or what his little habit is that he does, you know, and then you sort of bat it back and forth. Um, so I think, you know, you have to have the right partner for it. And uh, Jim uh, and I, you know, worked, worked pretty well on it together. Yeah. Um, but I would imagine for you that it's a, that it engages, I found it engages different parts of your imagination, the two types of work. Yeah, I mean, it, it, very much so. Um, writing fiction for me is much more immersive. It's impossible to separate your own experiences and your own thoughts and feelings. Um, 
screenwriting, even if it's not an adaptation, even if it's an original piece, you're working within these parameters of time, of budget, of genre, you know, all of these things that you don't have to think about when you when you write a, a novel. And um, particularly when you're doing an adaptation, that, that is a lot of craft. It's a lot of selecting the material. I mean, even talking about it, I'm using kind of woodworking terminology, but it's about, you know, deciding what to cut, what to move, how to shape a scene. And uh, I can write a novel in the morning and a script in the afternoon. I could never work on two different pieces of fiction at the same time. I think I, I, I find that too confusing, too, um, too distracting, too emotional, actually, because fiction always tends to come from a personal place for me. When I think with fiction, you, I find I enter into like a fugue state, like, yeah. I'm, like I'm dreaming yeah. it. And I have to, and I have to stay on it, or else I'll lose the dream. But I, you know, I write journalism, so I can, I can be working on fiction and journalism at the same time. But me, you know, my wife is a screenwriter, uh, right. and and the novelist, and so you know, I, I I vicariously, you know, watch the, you know, watch her on her various jobs, and you know, and and can see and have lived with, you know, a writer who's doing that work, which is, yeah, which yeah. is similarities, but also very very different in certain ways. Yeah. Well, it's fascinating. I, I, I really, I suppose, just to finish up, want to say again that it's a fantastic novel, uh, hugely impressive, very original, and does um, uh, such a vivid sense of, of place, but with a real um, emotional uh, engagement as well. So I, I, I really, really admired it. I, I want to hold it up to the camera, but I read it on a PDF. So you have to get Elliot to hold it up again. <laughs> And yes, and I do want to encourage everybody watching, we are posting links to where you can um, purchase Elliot's book, Red Dress in Black and White, um, and also his previous works, and of course, um, David Nichols's works as well. Uh, we love to support bookshop.org. We love to direct you there. It's really great when you type in your favorite author's name, say Elliot Ackerman or David Nichols, uh, their whole uh, catalog will come up on a search page and you can purchase all of their books, which we highly encourage. Um, and the other thing that's great about Bookshop is they are an indie supportive. If you're in the UK where David is, um, Hive is the is the indie supportive online uh, purchasing platform. And, uh, and if you can actually support in a local indie bookstore too, please do, um, you know, call your favorite local indie, ask them if they have the book, I'm sure they do. Um, and see what options they you have for shipping or curbside pickup or any sort of uh, one of my favorite bookstores down on Cape Cod where I am is actually doing drop offs um, at your home too, which is lovely. So, uh, so feel free to to check out all of your options. And guys, I'm going to let you go in just a second. But I have one question for both of you, um, yeah. which I've been sitting here thinking of all these things and absorbing all of this wonderful greatness. And usually I interrupt and talk to people, but I, I found myself just listening to this, this wonderful, fascinating conversation today. And one thing that strikes me about both of you, and it's my, my background as well, I have, I had a whole different career and a whole different life before, you know, transitioning into writing. And I'd love to hear from each of you. Obviously, you have two very different backgrounds. You have military and, and theater and the arts, but in they both influence you in different ways. And I'd be really curious to know from each of you, what is one major way that you think that your previous career has influenced your writing now? You can think about it for a second, but I'd love to hear from both of you on this. <laughs> you wanna go first, David? Uh, I think about this a lot because I was a failed actor and I'm inclined to look back and think of it Aren't as- Aren't we all? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I spent a lot of time watching, uh, even though I barely spoke on stage, I did watch amazing actors. And that whole training of how you create a character, what does your character want, what does your character need, how do they carry themselves, what's the rhythm of their speech, what's their sense of humour, what do they have for breakfast, all of that stuff you do uh, when you train as an actor, I've definitely, definitely used as a writer. When I was 21, 22, I wouldn't have dreamed of being a writer, but but there was a way to act, you know, either in amateur productions or in student productions or fringe productions. And so what I've come to realize now is that I was an actor because I really wanted to be a writer. 
and I didn't quite have the courage or confidence to do so. So it was kind of an apprenticeship, even though I didn't realize it at the time. And I, I learned a great deal now. I don't miss it because I was terrible, but I'd never uh, not want to be engaged in that world. And that's why I love doing screenwriting. That's the great excitement for me is working with actors. How about you, Elliot? Um, well, it's interesting. David, David is in London. My, my real prior life was I was, a, I was a skateboarder and a very artistic. I used to, I say you're in London, you know, I used to skateboard down at the South Bank. That's where I spent right, yeah, yeah, yeah. my youth growing up down there. I so, used to act in the National Theatre there. So, yeah, I know. I mean, <laughs> there you go. But um, so when I went, when I ran off at you know, 17 to go join the Marines, People were saying like it seemed like the craziest thing that I became a marine. So the people who've known me the longest don't say, you know, isn't it odd like, that you had this career in the military and you became a writer and are in the arts? It seems so strange. The people who know me the longest say, no, it's so strange that you ran off into the military for for all of these years. But you know, listen, I believe like you know, like Whitman says, you know, we all contain multitudes, and so. Um, you know, there was always that part of me and to do the job I did in the military, that part of me sort of lay dormant for many, many years, which was the artistic part of me, you know, and now that I'm, you know, that I write uh, the part of me that was in the military sort of lays dormant again. Um, but I think through my work, you know, I still am able to, to have access to that. And particularly the work that I do, you know, as a journalist and, you know, and how I do my research, which I would say is sort of more immersive. I like to kind of throw myself into situations and, you know, maybe that's the the old soldier and me coming out sometime who has that sort of, you know, that, that, that craving for a little bit of an adventure from time to time. That's so great. Well, your book certainly sounds like an adventure. Red dress in black and white. Let's hold it up one more time. Congratulations again. Thank, um, you. thank you both so much for being here. Elliot Ackerman and David Nichols. Um, please follow them on all of the social media platforms that they are on, Facebook, Twitter, or, or either of you on Instagram. Yeah, I know. <laughs> David's like, no way. Um, follow their website. Please, as we said, go out and purchase the books. Um, please purchase Red Dress in Black and White right now. And we eagerly um, await August 4th for Sweet Sorrow here in the U.S. Um, and Elliot, when is, the, uh, sorry, David, when is the, um, when is the release date in the U.K.? Is it? Uh, it's the same week, I think. Same I think that, it would, no, actually, it's out. It's been. It's still out in paperback, um, hardback, and ebook and audiobook in the U.K. It comes out in paperback uh, August the fourth. Great, wonderful. Thank you both so much again. Um, thank you to all of you out there who have joined us today, uh, and we can't wait to see you guys here on a Mighty Blaze sometime in the future. Thanks so much, and we'll see you guys next week. Thank you. Yeah.